What is happening? While the screen is being shared, we would like to really uh, talk about in today's lecture on the fabric structure and how the structure really controls the properties of fabric and to the properties, the applications of these fabrics. So we are trying to really link the properties and application to the certain uh, aspects of fabric structure, namely the fiber content, the way the fabric has been constructed, the elements of the structural uh, aspects of the fabric, and also the finishes which have been applied on the fabric. So it's a type of interlinkages between the structure and the properties and applications which we are going to talk about in the short presentation which we'll really have today. Uh, from the point of view of designers and engineers, it's important to understand what really controls the properties and application of textile materials. So, if we are really looking at the use of fabrics in various clothing application or in home textile application or even in technical textile applications, it's important for us to really uh, find out how these properties have been arrived at so that if you really want to change some of these properties, we could really take the necessary steps to modify the structure or use different materials or different finishes or different techniques of manufacturing to really get the right type of properties. So this is what we are going to be looking at in this particular uh, presentation. If we really look at the textile fabric, the fabric may be defined as an assembly of fibers and or yarns or a combination thereof. So basically, the way the fibers or the yarns are assembled in a seat material is what defines a textile fabric. And obviously, there are different ways in which we can really make these fabrics. And each one of these manufacturing methods is capable of really leading to a variety of structures uh, with very different uh, parameters, with very different raw materials used and therefore um, it's capable of leading to a very wide range of fabrics which in, uh, produce which really have very very different properties so what we are really going to try to look at today is how are we controlling uh, the fabric properties by changing the way we really manufacture our fabrics. Uh, Arpreet, are you able to share the screen? Just a minute, sir. Uh, we are doing yeah. it. We are
sir uh, harpreet sir was sharing his screen within a 2 minutes okay so sorry for the delay okay sir it's visible i think uh, yeah it's visible to all of you yeah but uh, the presentation oh, you can yes, really uh, okay. okay sir just wait Good. Uh, sir, is it visible? Yes, it's visible. If you can be enlarge it a okay, little sir. or okay. full screen. Okay, sir. I convey the message to her, please, sir. Just ah, call me. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Now is it okay, sir? Yeah, it's better. But like it may be one slide at a time, if possible. No, okay, it's not okay, really. Okay, okay sir. Okay, full sir. slide is not visible. Harpreet sir, can you please share a slide wise? Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that much be better. I yeah. Think. That okay. That's fine. Yes. Okay, okay, sir. So Sorry have, for that. Yeah. Ah, uh, we have talked about the fabrics. in general and the way the fibers or the yarns could be easily be assembled to make the fabrics so let's look at some of the structures which are commonly used for making textile silk materials so next slide if we really go in we really look at the woven fabrics and the way the woven fabrics are constructed could very uh widely differ both in terms of the size of the yarns used in terms of the spacing between the yarns as well as the way the yarns are arranged if you look at the pictures in one of the pictures the yarns have been arranged in a plain weave whereas in the next picture they have been arranged in a twill weave and both these would really lead to 
very different properties in the woven fabric. So you have many things uh, in terms of the yarn size, yarn spacing, twist levels in the yarn, the way the yarn, number of yarns which have been used by unit length and width, and also the design of this cloth, cloth structure, which will make a lot of difference. Uh, the amount of open spaces which you can see between the yarns will really determine the flow properties, the flow of air, water vapor, light, uh, sound, other uh, heat, etc., etc. So there will be the effect of these openings or the proportion of the area sort of covered by the yarns which will make a difference to a lot of uh, properties of these fabrics. If you look at another way, other ways of organizing the yarns in the structure, if you look at the next slide, we have the knitted structure and you could really recognize the web knitted structure in one picture and the white uh, warp knitted structure in the right hand picture and the way these yarns are interlooped to make this woven structure could really make a lot of difference to the extension properties of these fabrics. The amount of open spaces which you see would be much larger in the knitted structure. Therefore, the flow characteristics would really be much higher in the knitted structure as compared to the woven structure. The way the yarns have been arranged would also allow easier distortion of the fabric. Therefore, there is a large variety of ways in which the yarns could really be arranged. We just have looked at the weaving and the knitting, but there could be other varieties like the braiding or tuft or lace making or net, net production or other ways of arranging the yarns to make the seat material which will really change the properties of these fabrics considerably. Uh, apart from the making of seat materials through the yarn route, we could also make the textile materials or the seat materials directly from fiber as has been shown in the next slide. wherein we really look at the fiber seeds and if you really lay the fibers in some fashion and arrange these fibers to really act as a coherent seed or arrange a number of layers of these fiber seeds one on the top of the other as has been shown on the lower right hand corner of the picture we could really uh, make what is known as the fabric directly from fiber or what is known as the non-woven fabric and the way the fibers are arranged and the way the fibers are bonded in the fabric structure would really make a lot of difference to the properties of these fabrics. Uh, we are not going to be concentrating on non-woven structures in this particular presentation, but we'll be talking more about the woven structures made from the yarns and the knitted structures made from the yarns, which are the most popular ways of making uh, fabrics. So if you really look at the textile fabrics in the next slide, uh, we really know that the textile fabrics have been produced in different ways for thousands of years. It was known very early that assembling the fibers into the yarns and then assembling the yarns into a fabric structure can really produce a textile seat material which possesses the properties of warmth, strength, durability, and the ability to drape 
which are the most important properties in a textile fabric so this knowledge that arranging fibers into the yarn and then arranging these yarns in some systematic way to produce fabrics was really available with us for thousands of years uh um, if we really look at the next slide the different fabrics and their application uh numerous methods of making different fabrics have been sort of uh, sort of developed over the years uh, some examples are obviously weaving knitting tufting uh braiding lace making uh, net making uh and other methods of felting and other methods of sheet material produce production like non woven fabrics but weaving and knitting obviously are the main methods used for apparel and uh, household textile non wovens are primarily used for technical textile application so we are really basically be concentrating in this particular presentations on the woven and the knitted structures so if you really look at the fabric uh no this is fabric selection uh, maybe a slide prior to that okay this is okay fine fine go go ahead uh the fabric selection for a given end use application depends actually on the performance uh, requirements imposed by the uh, end use secondly it depends on the desired aesthetic characteristics of the end user and also obviously it depends on the price of the final product so the price performance uh, sort of ratio has to be in favor of selecting a particular fabric so what we are really going to be talking about how the performance requirements are fulfilled by different structures how the aesthetic characteristics are satisfied and how these could really be incorporated to give you the structure which is most beneficial for a particular application if we really look at the next particular slide we are starting to look at how to control the properties of the fabric the fabric structure obviously uh, has many components the most prominent one among them are the fiber content the way the yarns have been constructed the fabric construction method and the applied finishes each one of them obviously play a significant role in deciding the properties of the fabrics and their uses so if we really look at the next slide we start with looking at each one of them one by one and the first one is obviously the fiber selection or the fiber content we have many types of fibers available we have fibers of uh natural origin which could be plant based fibers which we could be animal based fibers we have fibers which could be regenerated fibers which we can really have fibers which are synthetic fibers we could really make fibers from metals ceramics and all the other types of uh, materials which are available to us so there is a very wide range of fibers and the selection of these fibers obviously becomes one of the very important component in deciding what properties we would really end up having in the fabric so if we really start looking at the fiber properties uh if 
we look at this list, none of these fibers really have all the desired properties. So in many of the application in order to reach the desired properties, we might really be blending fibers. So really, let's look at the importance of fiber blends and their uh, characteristics. So the next slide, we really look at the fiber blends. Uh, modern day living really uh, requires for clothing to have lightweight, clothing to be comfortable, to really uh, be safe, elegant, easy to handle, as well as uh, should really be hard wearing. No single fiber obviously has all the properties which are desirable in the fabric. Uh, the blended yarns composed of two or more components of uh, different five types of fibers such as a woolen polyester, woolen acrylic, polyester and cotton, polyester viscose, etc., etc., <coughs> could really lead us to the blends which could really uh, produce yarns with very different desirable properties. So, for reasons that we are not able to get the desired properties in the fabrics from a single fiber, often we really resort to the fiber blends. So the reason why we really do blending could really be summarized as we have done it in the next slide, uh, is to really have a combination of merits of different fibers. If you look, really look at the next slide, Apart from the combination of merits of different fibers, it also allows us the opportunity to produce the color effects and also could really lead to a cost reduction and could really lead to a cheaper uh, fabric. So we could really look at blending of the fibers uh, for various different regions. Uh, if you really look at the next slide, we give some examples uh, of, say, brands of cotton and uh, viscose rayon uh, and the polyester. If you really look at the properties of these two groups of um, fibers, the polyester has many desirable properties like good crease recovery, uh, good wrinkle recovery, uh, has the uh, better dimensional stability, better abrasion resistance, ease of really wash, uh, sort of ease of wearing, and we really have many other properties which are desirable, which are not present in the cellulosic fibers, on the other hand, cellulosic fibers really have many desirable properties which are not there in the uh, synthetic fibers like polyester, like the good sort of uh, moisture absorption, good static behavior or good static dissipation, good really moisture vapor transmission characteristics, good feel, good uh, handle, and uh, biodegradability. So really, if we really look at the positive and the negative attributes of both polyester as well as cellulosic fibers, we find that blending them could really lead us to uh, have the prop positive attributes of both these fibers uh, in the resultant fabric. So we often do the blending. 
So often we really uh, mix fibers for reasons of price. We mix uh, fibers for reasons of aesthetics, and we mix fibers for reasons reasons of providing the desired functionalities in the fabric. We then start looking at the second element of the fabric structure, which is the yarn uh, parameters and uh, fabric properties. In woven and knitted fabric, if you look at the next slide, uh, fibers cannot be utilized directly unless they are converted into the yarns. The act of combining fibers into the yarns creates a new structure which has the properties of its own. The most significant aspects of the yarn structure are the yarn diameter, the yarn twist, the packing density of the yarn, and the yarn cross-sectional shape, to name just a few. You may really have other characteristics like yarn hairiness, unevenness, and so on and so forth. But if you really look at the two most important properties like yarn diameter and yarn twist, in the next slide, we really look at the effect of the yarn diameter. The yarn diameter affects the fabric thickness, cover of the fabric, the flow characteristics of the fabric, and also the uh, number of other properties which are extremely important. The yarn diameter depends on the fiber characteristics, the fineness, the stiffness, the cross-sectional shape, and the crimp in the fiber, as well as the number of fibers in the cross-section, and the way the fibers have been packed to make the yarn structure. So, the way the diameter is arrived at could really affect many properties, and this diameter is also arrived at based on the number of fiber properties. So if you really look at this next slide, which really talks about the uh, yarn twist, the twist affects the compactness of the diameter, stiffness of the yarns, abrasion resistance, and also the tensile behavior of the yarn. So depending on the diameter and the twist, we could really uh, make fabric structures which would really be very different in the properties. And if you really look at the next slide, we show some aspects of how the diameter could really vary significantly, how the compactness of the yarn very signif very significantly, and how the yarns could really be twisted, and this twisting, and the number of twists which we have per unit length in the yarn could really affect significantly the properties of the resultant yarns, and therefore, the properties of the fabric. We then start looking at our fabric characteristics. The characteristics of different types of fabric vary considerably according to the details of the construction and the way the yarns are used. The woven cloth may really be harsh and stiff as in the canvas, or soft and uh, spongy, as in the case of blankets, or smooth and soft and luxurious, as in case of the uh, satin fabrics. So, it's, uh, even within the woven fabric structure itself, depending on the way the yarns have been used, 
the type of yarns which have been used or the number of uh, yarns which have been used uh, or the way the yarns have been utilized in terms of creating the open or the closed structure one can really have very very different properties if you look at the next picture what we are really seeing is that the staple fiber based yarns would really have the yarns which are arranged in a different fashion and we will have also the hairs which would be protruding on the surface of the structure in between the yarns there would be caps which would be available for the easier passes but the yarn itself are uh, only partially packed so you have a uh, sort of low packing density of these yarns so they will also allow the flow of air water vapor etc through the yarn itself apart from through the open spaces between the yarns so both the way the yarns cover the space as well as the compactness of the yarn would really determine the properties of the fabric some aspects of the fabric structure that really must be taken into account are the method of construction that is the type of weave or the knitted structure which we have selected the number of yarns per unit length the yarn crimp and the extent of yarn flattening in the structure so uh, these aspects obviously would determine the fabric properties other aspects of the fabric properties would depend significantly on the spatial finishes which may also affect the next slide if we really look at is this one the spatial finishes which may really be applied could really change the behavior considerably the effect of the fabric processing and the spatial finishes must be taken into account while considering the uh, re resultant fabric properties for a particular and use application therefore some of the total of behavior fabric behavior depends on the fiber which has been selected or the fiber blends which have been selected the yarn structure which has been formed the fabric construction as well as the finishing behavior uh what we would really now like to look at are some properties and the way these properties are derived from what we have discussed so far so if the first property i'm taking is the abrasion resistance the way the fabric gets rubbed against surfaces or with the skin uh, would really affect the durability of the fabric as well as the aesthetic characteristics of the fabric uh, some fibers like nylon and polyester obviously have better abrasion resistance then the fibers like cotton and viscose uh within the structure loosely twisted yarns uh uh could really abrade more as compared to the tightly twisted yarns tighter fabric construction with balanced crimp allows the pressure to the fabric to be shared over a larger surface area and therefore could really lead to better abrasion resistance and could really be uh, providing you with the hard wearing uh, fabric structure so both the fiber content is important yarn structure is important as well as the uh, fabric construction and the way the fabric has been formed whether it's a balanced fabric or it's a unbalanced fabric 
could really make a lot of difference to the average of the system. This uh, particular figure basically shows the one of the ways in which abrasion can really be measured. So if you really have the fabrics which are rubbed against the abrading surfaces, then after a particular number of cycles, either you could really form a hole or you could really stop to look at the fabric and see what type of changes which have occurred in the fabric whether you have the thickness loss, you have a weight loss, you have loss in the strand, or you have loss in the uh, appearance of the fabric, which could really be your end point of a abrasion test. Another aspect which is associated with the fabric is the pilling. As the fabric rubs against the surfaces, the staple fiber fabric would really lead to the fiber balls appearing on the fabric surface. So the pilling is obviously a fabric surface defect, which is characterized by the little fiber balls uh, clinging to the cloth surface and giving the garment the unsightly uh, appearance. The pilling obviously is more of a problem in the spun yarn uh, knitted fabric because in general in the knitted structure we tend to utilize low twist yarn and the structure is more open and loose and therefore it becomes easier for the breeding surface to pull out the fibers and roll them into the balls. Another aspect which will be important is whether these balls would really come out easily. In this picture, if you really look at, we have a small group of fibers which have appeared in one particular location. And this uh, set of fibers, if really clings to the fabric surface, would really make the surface uh, ugly. So this particular phenomena is related to abrasion is, is, and is an important aspect in the fabrics which are meant for the clothing applications. We now really look at another property which is often important, not so much in the sort of a everyday clothing or in the uh, uh, laser textiles, but this property becomes important in some applications uh, such as say the car seat belts, parachute harnesses and fabrics and the cargo slings to name just a few of them. Uh, in many of the applications like the roofs, cords, etc., the structure is going to be under heavy tensile load during its use and unless the structure is able to take the load which is coming on it, it will really not be able to sustain itself. So many fabrics uh, are going to be important uh, from the point of view of the uh, tensile properties. Um, many factors obviously contribute to the tensile strength and the breaking elongation of the fabric. The fiber strength and the elongation is a component of the fibers which contribute to the fabric strength. The twist level and the yarn structure is the next component. The thread density and the yarn trim in the fabric is another one. Now this is a typical arrangement in which the fabric strength could really be assessed. That is you have a fixed jaw and you have a movable jaw and between the two jaws if you hold the fabric and move the jaw 
you really develop the tensile load which could be assessed with the help of a load cell and the separation of the two jaws will really give you the amount of elongation which is occurring and at some stage the yarns in the structure will start rupturing which could lead to the end point of the test and the amount of load which could really be uh, taken by a fabric would determine um, where this fabric could really be used. Obviously a much smaller load must come in the actual use as compared to the breaking load in the structure because for many reasons the tensile properties are going to change over a period of time and as the fabric is used uh, in the but in a particular application therefore uh, only a fraction of the actual tensile load or the elongation is uh, going to be what is uh, required to come in the actual uh, application so let's look at another property which is the uh, tearing strength and the tearing is this energy. Now from our experience with we really know that the most fabrics which we use in the apparels or households do not really break to the tensile load application but they break to the tearing. The resistance of <coughs> tearing is important in really when deciding the uh, fabric which could really be important in the case of say shirting, blouses, the interlining and other technical fabrics. Uh, if you really look at the way a tear is being propagated, we would really be able to understand that what is going to be important is the strength of the individual yarn but more important would be whether the structure of the fabric allows the grouping of the yarns to take place during the application of the uh, uh, load to tear the fabric. So if you apply the tear load and if you can really break one yarn at a time then the tear strength of that fabric is going to be very poor. Whereas if the yarn uh, fabric structure is loose and the yarns have more strength then it will allow the yarns to group together and instead of breaking one yarn at a time you would really be breaking many yarns as a bundle and therefore you will end up getting much higher tearing strength. Normally in order to measure the tearing strength both the methods of finding the tearing load as well as finding the tearing energy in a instrument like the Elmendorf tearing tester shown on the right hand side is used wherein the kinetic energy of a uh, weight um, or a sector is used and this kinetic energy is partly used in sort of tearing the fabric and partly is recovered as the potential energy of the sector hammer and <clears throat> the difference between the initial energy and the recovered energy would give you the energy used in tearing the fabric. So simple tests could really be utilized in tearing the fabric. The next property we like to look at is the bursting strength. Now the bursting strength is commonly <clears throat> refer to when we apply a uniformly distributed force over a given area of the fabric uh, surface and this type of um, forces are applied in many technical applications such as uh, the ones which are like the bursting of the tire fabric or the 
bursting of the uh, sort of a, a hose, fluid hose, or the, the sort of a direct mechanism, um, mechanical pressure, pump uh, sort of diaphragms, the filter fabrics, parachute fabrics, hoses, turpaline fabrics, bags, etc. In which what we really are looking at is a force normal to the fabric surface is applied. Therefore, the fabric is supposed to take the force uniformly over the entire surface area. And we are going to really be looking at the way the fabric could really be withstanding those forces. So if you really look at uh, some of the properties which will be important is from the bursting strength point of view would really be how balanced the yarn uh, are in the fabric structure and whether both warp and weft yarns really uh, sort of break simultaneously. <coughs> so next, let's really look at some other properties which are important from comfort point of view. And the first property we like to look at is the thermal conductivity. Uh, well, the thermal conductivity uh, uh, will depend on the fiber conductivity, but also will depend on the fabric thickness and also the ability of the uh, fabric structure to interact the air within the fabric as well as related to the open spaces which are there. All these things would really determine how easily the heat could really flow through the fabric structure. The still air obviously is an excellent insulation material and if we can really have the fibers yarn or the fabric structure which could really uh, entrap a lot of air, we would really provide fabrics which will have more warmth and better insulation properties. Uh, if you really look at uh, the quilted fabrics from that point of view, these are the best because we are able to have a non-woven structure inside the tightly woven two seeds which are covering the uh, sort of fibrous structure. The fibrous structure holds a lot of still air and provide a lot of insulation. If you really look at the mechanisms through which the body heat is passing through the fabric into the atmosphere, what you would really look at, if you just look at the dry heat mechanisms, because what we really have is, and the heat from the body is lost, not only to the dry heat mechanisms, but, but also through the evaporation of perspiration as well as the respiratory heat losses. And even if we really look at just the dry heat losses, we have the conduction characteristics of the fabric, we have the radiation characteristics of the fabric, and we really have the convection properties of the fabric, which would really make a lot of difference too the way the fabric is able to provide an insulating layer over the uh, human body. So we would really have to design the fabrics accordingly. Look at another characteristics which is a flow property and the air permeability is the ability of air obviously to pass through the fabric structure, the fabric cover and obviously the packing density of the yarns uh, would obviously influence the air permeability considerably. When the compact yarns are used and packed tightly into a structure, the permeability of such a structure would really be very low, whereas if you really have an open structure and low packing uh, packed yarns, then we really have 
the higher permeability. That's why later structures which have higher air permeability as compared to the woven structure because there are less of the cover being provided by the yarn structure in the knitted fabric. Mm -hmm. A simple way of sucking the air through the fabric could really be used. The rate at which the air is being sucked and the pressure drop it needs to create in order to suck the air could really be used to measure how easy it is for air to flow through a fabric. Next, we really look at the moisture vapor transfer, which is very important from the comfort point of view, especially in case of the tightly woven fabric structures. Like air permeability, water uh, transmission can really occur uh, through the density of the fabric construction the tight uh, closed construction would really allow low water transmission, to, water vapor transmission to take place. Uh, but here there is another factor which comes into effect, that which is that if you really have the uh, construct, uh, fi hydrophobic fibers, then the, the absorption, deabsorption or the diffusion mechanisms cannot come into play, whereas the hydrophilic fibers would allow the water vapor transmission to take place even in very tightly constructed fabric. Therefore, the selection of the fibers become extremely important if we are really looking at the tight construction in the fabric for some other characteristics uh, in the fabric. Next one is obviously the aesthetic related properties which we are really talking about. Um, maybe we can really go back a slide and look at the uh, crease resistance and the crease recovery and the wrinkle recovery. The way the creases are formed in the fabric when the fabrics are folded together and uh, the way once the forces are released the wrinkles which really remain or recover could really define the aesthetic characteristics of the fabric considerably while the fabrics which really are made from the stiff fibers will offer uh, more crease resistance and uh, would also be more uh, resilient fibers could really produce fabrics which will really have the higher crease recovery and the wrinkle recovery. So the fiber selection becomes one important uh, factor. Once again the loosely woven fabric or the tightly woven fabrics could really affect the way the creases are formed in the structure and the way the creases recover and the wrinkles are left in the fabric structure. Ideally, one should really have a balance of the tightness and the uh, stiffness so that the creases are difficult to form, but once the creases are formed, they should really be enough uh, energy in the structure to cause the good recovery from those creases and obviously some fibers and some constructions are more prone to such a behavior. Let's look at another as associated property which is the drape. The way the fabric really hangs under its own weight and this is extremely important from the point of view of designers and aesthetic behavior of the fabric. Uh, most important properties are the bending and the shear properties of the fabric. Uh, the stiffness of the fibers and the yarn 
the diameters of the yarn and the tightness of the fabric construction will all affect the bending and the shear properties of the fabric and hence will decide the way the fabric hangs when allowed to hang under its own weight as in case of the uh, dresses as in the case of curtain fabrics as in case of mini drapes uh, let's look at another property which is associated uh, is the way the fabric feels when one really touches it uh, this property is extremely important but is was or is primarily a subjective property because the way the fabric is perceived by the people when we touch it uh, differs quite a bit. However, in 70s, a lot of effort was really made in order to find out what features of the structure or what features of the uh, fabric would really have more desirable property in a particular uh, fabric and a lot of work was done in order to really relate some of the mechanical, physical as well as the dimensional properties of the fabric with the subjective assessment of the fabric by Kawabata and his group in Japan and what they really could uh, sort of find out is that there are six basic characteristics of the fabric properties which are extremely important. Among them are the tensile behavior. These are all low stress mechanical properties like tensile, bending, shearing, compressional behavior. Then we have surface properties and we also have the dimensional properties such as weight and thickness. And they were able to relate these properties to the perceived feel of the fabric by the experts. So we really now uh, are able to look at some properties and the way these properties depend on the fiber selected, the yarn uh, selected, and the way the yarns are put into the fabric structure, the constructional features of the fabric, and also some aspects of the way the uh, fabric uh, properties are derived at in, uh, in uh, different fashion, depending on what we are able to do with our selection. So in conclusion, what we really can say is that the various components of the fabric uh, sort of together determine the properties of the fiber and is uh, together determine the properties of the fabric and is uses the form and the properties of the fibers, the yarn structure, the fabric constructional properties would really affect the fabric properties considerably. So this is what we have been done, uh, been able to do in this particular thing. But if you really look at the next slide, what we are really saying that it is therefore necessary to really consider the fabric structure in its entirety as the properties of the fabric are affected by a number of the yarn fabric and the finishing uh, parameters which we have not really considered uh, in detail in this particular presentation. Uh, through suitable selection of the fibers and the manufacturing method and the fabric parameters and finishes, we can really produce fabrics with the required characteristics for different end-use applications. 
So this was in brief what I wanted to cover in trying to relate the fabric structure with the properties of the fabric and the way these properties could really impact the way these uh, fabrics are utilized in various applications. So with this I close and maybe you could really have many questions related to what we are really have talked about in this particular presentation. Um, the detailed presentation where you could really uh, look at subsequently, but uh, what we would really love, like to see is some responses from the audience and see whether we could really together discuss uh, something relating the fabric structure and the resultant properties. Thank you. Any questions from the participants? Anyone please ask? Hello. Hello. Uh, identify Hello. yourself and then ask the question. Uh, Go ahead. Can you ask it? Uh -huh. Hello. Please. Yes, go ahead. I can hear you. Vijay, sir. My name is Anup. Hello. Vijay, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go Sir, I want to know what is the thread count and which thread count is used for the making the search. Okay. Uh, there is a sort of a confusion in the industry. Uh, industry tends to use, see, we tend to use the thread count in terms of the, uh, either the yarn number or the denier or the count of the yarn which we can really use in different systems. But in industry, the thread count is often used as the number of threads per unit length in warp and weft. And often, this is added together to uh, look at the thread count in a seating material. So if you really talk to the experts who are really looking at the basket or the seating material, uh, they will really refer to a thread count of uh, 300 or 160 thread count. This basically refers to the number of threads per inch of a fabric in warp and weft put together. That is a combined number of threads in one inch of the uh, warp threads and one inch of the weft thread. But what we really refer to is the yarn number, which is basically to deal with the size of the yarn or the weight of the yarn per unit length, as in the direct system, or the length of the yarn per unit weight, as in the, our indirect systems like cotton wool, etc. Uh, uh, yes. Hello. Uh, have you been able to understand that count yes, sir, uh, yes, and, the, uh, and the yarn numbering system which we teach is yes. basically based on the weight per unit length or the length per unit weight. But in industry, often the thread count is referred to as the number of threads per unit length in the uh, woven material. Thank you so much, Vijay, sir. Sir, is there any difference between thread count and fabric count? Ah, uh, 
uh, there is nothing, no thing like a fabric count. See, basically, what really would you be having is a fabric construction. Now, in this construction, we have the what we normally tend to talk talk about is the number of ends per unit length and the number of picks per unit length, yes. or the number of walks per unit length and number of web per unit length. Okay. Now this. Uh, is uh, one aspect. Then the size of the warp yarn and the web yarn would really be based on either the weight per unit length of the yarn or the length per unit weight of the yarn, depending on whether you're using the direct system or indirect system of the yarn uh, number measurement. So, uh, yarn count is one aspect but there's nothing like the fabric count uh, what we really are the fabric number what we have is the thread count which is the actual physical number of threads per unit length in warp and weft put together in industry sir per unit length per unit area sir per unit length अगर मान लीजिए there are 60 thirds per unit per inch in the warp and 90 thirds per inch in the web, so 90 plus 60 will become 150. So the thread count uh, in from the industry point of view is 150 for this particular fabric. And we write. Uh, uh, I multiply sign. No, no. Ha, we write it with a multiply sign. Multiply. And, but but we, we, add we don't them. multiply. But we, we add them. Well, in multiplication sign, we really are writing both individually. But when we really write the thread density, we only write the sum of the two. So when we write number of ends per unit length multiplied by number of picks per unit length, then we are really writing individually the number. If we add this together, this in industry terms becomes the thread count. And there is no such uh, 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 figure like fabric count. Fabric count is nothing. No, no, there is no such figure uh, for the fabric count. There is a thread count in the fabric, in a woven fabric. So this is a count of the thread. Just look at it physically. This is a count of numbers per unit length. And the unit length has to be defined properly because earlier we used to have uh, per inch. Then we started using per centimeter or per meter. And uh, depending on this, the numbers would change considerably. The current industry practice, when they are really saying this is a 160 thread count uh, sort of bed sheet is basically the uh, numbers per inch in walk plus numbers per inch in the weft direction number of thread per inch in the web direction added together and it is applicable both for woven and knitted fabrics sir? no it's applicable only in the woven fabric in knitted fabric, what you have is what is known as the number of courses and number of width per unit uh, uh, length, as well as when you multiply, what you have is a stitch density. <coughs> Hello, sir. Thank you. Sir? Go ahead. Sir, can on your yeah. Okay, take it. Uh, you, you speak. You, you ask Malikami. Oh, sir, it's nice to hear from you. Thank you for such kind of presentation. Sir, I want to uh, uh, know uh, from your side that there is one more uh, type of system of presenting the sewing threads. That is the ticket number. Yes. Can you elaborate that for me? No, I think uh, this you will have opportunity of uh, sort of getting. Once again, this is to do with the size of the thread, but again and the way it is matched with the type of needle but probably sewing experts would be able to throw some more light on it maybe i am not really the right person to throw that light 
I am Anirban Dutta. Uh, actually, at first I expressed my regards to you, uh, sir. My one uh, question is about the handle part. You have uh, shown in the slide that these parameters of handle. One of the input factor was surface. Uh, so, sir, how we can express the surface of a fabric in in uh, in which term? Okay. Uh, now, normally we tend to use uh, two major properties, which uh, we uh, really use. One is the surface roughness, that is the way the structure is formed. So when you touch, there would be certain troughs and valleys in the fabric. And this is a surface roughness uh, sort of measurement is possible in the cow butter instruments, which have been designed specially. And then the second property is the friction. That is, as you slide your fingers, on the surface of the fabric, you would really uh, feel certain resistance to the movement. If you have the higher friction fabric, then you will feel more resistance. Whereas if you have smoother fabrics, uh, low friction fabric, then you will have the uh, sort of easier movement. And both these properties are really assessed uh, in uh, Kawabata instruments that is the way the roughness of the fabric uh, is there in terms of the uneven structure uh, the troughs and valleys in the structure and also the frictional properties of the fabric i hope this uh, and the kawabata uh, friction tester is available in the literature you can really have a look at it so coefficient of friction, the variation in the coefficient of friction, and the surface roughness characteristics are all assessed and used as the input parameters. Similarly, when we talk about the tensile properties or bending properties or shear properties, we really derive each in each one of them two or three characteristics from the shear test or bending test or the tensile test and use them as the input parameters and relate the subjectively assessed fabric handle by the people. See, this work has been going on for virtually last 70 years. Started with peers who de developed a method of pulling out a fabric through a ring and the force required to pull out a fabric from a ring was really related to the way the, way the fabric would really feel. Kawabata says that obviously this doesn't really take into account all the fabric characteristics that are important. And he really identified 16 parameters from these six, six uh, fabric property groups and related them to the subjective handle. So this is what was done. And detailed presentation on fabric handles are available uh, in the literature or in the book, maybe if you look at even the testing book, you will really find something on the Kawabata instruments and the fabric characteristics we can assist for measuring the fabric end. Good. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, one of the participants asked the questions on PP suits. And a PP suit, sir. PP suit. Yes, sir. Okay, what is that? Uh, uh, personal uh, protective uh, equipment? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so uh, what is the question? PP, uh, question is PP suit uh, generally are not comfortable to wear. What type hmm. of soft, comfortable, breathable fabrics that can replace that PP, uh, that can be used uh, more comfortably in the PP suits? Okay. I think uh, the PP suit which is used for the medical application nowadays or the COVID overalls are extremely badly designed and badly sort of propagated a piece of uh, uh, garments. Uh, less said about this, better it is because they have not really been designed for the purpose. See, when we design a personal protective equipment, we really look at the threat perception 
and the way the threat has to be met by the clothing material which is to be used. In this particular case, this was really not done. What we really used was something which was meant for some other type of uh, sort of uh, infections or some other categories of uh, illnesses in which this type of overalls are to be employed. The virus can only enter through the mouth, nose or eyes. So these are the only places from where the virus can really enter the human body. There is no other place from which the uh, sort of human body could really take this virus inside the body. And even if it goes through the wound, etc., it will not really harm the person. So basically what we really need to cover is only up to the neck. The rest of the clothing could be the normal clothing which we wear and the virus could really be taken care of by suitably washing the hands and taking the shower after the um, job is done. So according to me, the PPE kit or the PPE dress should really be redesigned looking at the threat perception, the job the people are supposed to be doing in the uh, COVID situation and then give out a uh, equipment which is well suited to the requirement rather than sort of imposing something which is not really required. And then what we really said, questioner is rightly said that what we have is a plastic coated with a spun bond non-woven which is highly uncomfortable and most of the doctors are dying because of those uh, coveralls rather than the actual virus really uh, sort of affecting them. So probably once you really look at the design of the personal protective equipment in the COVID environment once again and maybe your designers should really start thinking and then the design should start from uh, looking at the threat perception how this threat is to be met through the clothing intervention. Thank you. Any other question from the participants? Yes, sir. Excuse me, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yes, sir. sir, I'm Hamdan Roshni from Manipur and a clothing and textile student from the Maharaja Sahaja University of Baroda. And so my question is, what is the relationship between air permeability and the thermal conductivity? Uh, so we use heated fabric in both uh, these properties. Heated uh, uh, fabric has higher air permeability and also insulation. So what is the relation between these two properties? Okay. Uh, now this is a question which a lot of things have been published. Uh, if you really want better insulation, obviously you should really have low permeable fabric because as soon as you have higher permeable, the air can only pass through the vacant spaces or the spaces between the fibers or between the yarn. So if you, as soon as you have spaces between the fibers and the yarn, then the heat is allowed to flow through convection and radiation very easily. So you'll have poor thermal insulation or the higher conductivity of the material. Uh, so these two things would have to be balanced. A lot of it has been published in the thermal properties of the fabric. You are referred to many of the books. I myself must have published at least 50 papers in this particular area and a uh, lot of literature is available so you should really see the mechanisms which are involved in allowing the heat to the fabric and the mechanisms which are used for uh, air to flow through the fabric for air to flow through the fabric the cover the thickness of the fabric and the packing density of the yarns are the most important parameters. But 
for the thermal insulation one should really look at the other aspects also and if you are also looking at the heat loss from body you should really look at the heat losses through perspiration uh, and evaporation and also heat losses to respiratory uh, means so respiration should really account for once again significant amount of heat losses when the uh, work conditions or the activity levels are very very high uh, but i think it's a very short time to really answer this particular question but if you do a google search or go, go to a google scholar and look at this papers which are available all easily you will find lot of literature in there okay sir i understood the mechanism that my dog is that we use both Airy nature as well as the soft yarn and more air spaces. So if you can really use knitted jersey underneath a wind cheater or a coat or a uh, sort of a upper garment which is a sort of tightly woven structure, then knitted fabric could really be highly insulating. So one really should understand whether you are using. a knitted structure between the seats or using the knitted structure on its own if you use the sweater directly and go out in a windy environment you will feel the chill but if you use a sweater uh, under a shirt and under a coat or a overcoat you will feel the warmth of a sweater so the way the fabric structure is utilized it could also be very important in designing thank you sir thank you sir and another uh, so yeah. another question is ma'am uh, sir which one is better the blended fiber yarn or uh, by composite yarns or coarse spun yarn which uh, one is better in terms of functionality this is very taking you in a very different type we think we have to really understand what is a coarse spun yarn what is a carded yarn what is a combed yarn what is a uh, lotus spun yarn and all the other yarn structure and also we should really be looking at uh, filament yarn structure textured yarn structure there are so many yarn structures which are available so each one is capable of giving you different characteristics and once again one has to really look at the yarn structure and the way it is utilized in the fabric uh, so we cannot really directly answer in yes and no which one is better or which one is not better unless we really look at the entire engineering uh, sort of design in which the yarns are used in which the clothing assemblies are made and the way we have really uh wanting to utilize them in actual use thank you thank you sir thank you sir we can really have many questions so yes sir yes sir uh, no yes sir. let us wind up sir. wind up now yes sir yes thank you sir for a very insightful presentation in a very simple words and your presentation will go a long way to enhance the Technical know how of te textile, sir. It's a very really wonderful, sir. And uh, specifically, sir, uh, to have you in your in your session in in our session, it will really add the value in our uh, to our program, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. Right. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thanks a lot, and uh, enjoy yourself and look at look uh, look at other presentations to find answers to many questions and keep asking the. questions because this is what would really make uh, you alert in your mind and try to find some answers thank you
Thank you. Thank you so much, sir.